The coconuts are a family of six living aboard an engineless sailboat and voyaging the world. Some would call it crazy, but the coconuts call it home. I hope you enjoy the interview and boat tour. How long have you had this boat? Uh, we've had this boat for about five years now. Wow. Where did you find her? We salvaged her in Florida. So she was abandoned in Florida, basically. It was the original owner we ended up getting it from. He had it built in 1982. It's a prototype, it's a one-off. He raced it on the East Coast out of New York Yacht Club. And it went down to Florida, to a marina, and was just sitting there. And one day, a big hurricane came through. This big barge broke off and took out like three other marinas and Messenger broke off and went up onto the shore. And, and so he claimed Messenger basically as a loss. He took it farther up the river, sat in the morning and there it sat. So when we went on the boat, we were the first people on the boat in five years. Five years yeah. on a mooring ball? On a mooring ball. I was able to go look at it first and so I knew what kind of boat and sort of potential that it had. It was worth going through the trouble of saving. It went from the brink of, of death you know, yeah. Many things were stolen. The primary winches were stolen. The backstay hydraulics were stolen. We had to jury rig it and get it out of this place and sail it 70 miles north to where we could haul her out, you know. <laughs> so there must have been so much growth on the hull. Yeah, yeah. Well, I had to go. I had to go clean it, which was a funny experience because you know, of course, there's alligators in these rivers. Oh, great. You know, and so I'm talking to these people who are professional divers cleaning the bottom. You know, and they're like. Yeah, it's not really an issue. They don't really bother you. You know, you can just get in and clean it. And so, I, I mean, I took their advice, but I think I was the most terrified I've, <laughs> I've been cleaning the bottom ever. You know? So it was interesting. How long did it take you to get her in shape enough so that you could start living aboard? What happened was is that we left the girls at my grandma's house. Natasha and I basically just moved on right away. We said, okay, well, let's just take the saloon. Let's just try to clean it as much as possible so that we can cook on one side on this like camping stove and then sleep on the other side and then kind of go from there. We were able to clean and kind of paint a bit of the inside and once we got it out on the hard and after the first month we brought the girls. And then I just started working on the rig and the deck and it was maybe four or six months to get it to basically sailing shape and a decent liveaboard. And then we went to Bahamas and Cuba and Costa Rica. And wow. Yeah. Costa Rica and Panama, and then uh, we went to uh, Colombia and Curaçao and the Caribbean islands, and then Bermuda, and then New York and Newport, Rhode Island. So, and then you stayed in Newport for a while. Yeah, we ended up staying there for about nearly two years. The boat was out of the water, I think, like like seven months or something like that, and I was working on it pretty hard every day and wow. just took you know everything off the decks repainted everything I replaced 23 square feet of core in the deck oh my god so that was soft and yeah so it's been through quite a bit but now it's it's uh, it's it's really nice it's basically to a point that you don't have to do too much you know especially because everything's very simple that we just there's the maintenance issues are just very little kind of things not so not so much. So. Did you do all the refit work yourself? Well, I had some people help me here and there, you know, uh, basically just helping me uh, with doing, you know, like sanding and things like this that were just like overwhelming amounts of work, you know. I had this really cool Portuguese kid uh, uh, in, in Newport who was helping me, who was just wanting to learn more about boats and things. So it was really, wow. yeah, it was really cool. Worked so he'd work all, for both of you. Yeah, he would work all day uh, working on, on boats and then he would come work with me all night working on boats, you know, sometimes we would, I know, we, we sprayed the primer on, it was like, you know, 12 o'clock at night or something like that, so it was a, it was around the clock, you know. When did you leave Newport, and where did you go since then? We left Newport in August, I think, of last, of last year. From Newport, we went to Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, which is a great little, little boat building history town. And we went to St. Pierre and Miquelon, the last French hold in the Americas, really. And from there, we went to Newfoundland. And from Newfoundland, we jumped off and sailed to Iceland. How long was the passage? It took us 14 days. We were, of course, always searching for a good window, but that, that summer was just incredibly active in the Labrador area. It was just constant storm after storm after storm after storm. Like every three days or something, there was a brand new storm. Mm -hmm. and, 
you know, like nine, nine sixty, nine eighty millibars. You know, just like pretty gnarly ones. We just kept waiting, and then finally there was a bit of a, a bit of a window, and so we took it. And then, as a low went through, we went right on the back of it, and we just tried to ride it as long as we could. And we knew after that that we were kind of unsure until the new wind filled in from a low that was going to hopefully pass south of us. So, we were just thinking, okay, there's going to be a moment of. Of we don't really know what the wind's going to be. It's going to be very variable, and we made it basically 600 miles. We were south of Greenland, and that's where the low just left us. And so then we were just sitting there bobbing around. In five days, we went 30 nautical miles. You were becalmed yeah. south of Greenland. <laughs> In hindsight, I wish that I could have uh, enjoyed it as much as possible. But for me, the calms are really the difficult, the most difficult portion of any passage is any type of calms. You know. Especially being there, because of course you're like in, you're just in the alley. It's right. like uh, you know, taking a nap. On I the love the calms because it gives us a break. <laughs> yeah. from the same they're they're all happy, and I'm sitting there biting my nails. Right, you, know, you don't know what's <laughs> coming next. Yeah, exactly. And I feel like we're like taking a nap on a freeway or something. You know, just just. Uh, but uh, it was nice. We lit the stove and we warmed up the cabin, and we the girls were playing cards. And in five days, we moved 30 nautical miles. I mean, there would be like. I don't know, a half an hour that some wind would come through and I'd put up the sails and we get going and okay, it's gonna stay, it's gonna, here we go, we're gonna go now. And then it would just and die. So we maybe we made it, you know, three miles. Did and then the next day, you know. So. <laughs> Did you encounter any rough weather on that passage or? Yeah, we had, I mean, sort of what would be normally expected in, in the area. When the wind finally filled in, of course it filled in on our nose because the low that was coming, it passed just to the south of us. So they're going counterclockwise in the Northern Hemisphere, the lows are, and so we had, tr we had headwinds. We were going in like 20 to 30 knots sustained uh, on the nose. And it would, it was so stubborn, just keep keep coming straight from Reykjavik, the the wind. Um, so we just have two or three reefs in the main and a and a storm jib on and um, and just going going to weather, you know. Wow. But but yeah, it was it was it was bumpy ride and and it, but it was fine. You know? It was definitely a hard passage. Uh, you know, it's very tiring for for all of us because this boat is you know it's it's quite rough it's fast but it's very very rough it's a light boat mm. and and uh it's sort of like a driving and i think uh, there was a vani globe racer that said it, it's like driving a truck with square wheels which is true you know so it was just <laughs> slamming so that just the noise gets very um tiring so as we were coming up to Reykjavik we could see the lights of Reykjavik and it was it was night and it got really clear and calm and then we could see the aurora borealis and that was the first time we ever seen it and at that moment everything became worth it you know this hard passage it was about i would say eight degrees to uh, 10 degrees inside the the cabin celsius maybe uh, 50 degrees fahrenheit mm. uh, inside the cabin so we were all sort of cold and for a long time and, but you know it's not really that that bad, you know? Yeah. <laughs> How long were you in Iceland? And we were in what Iceland. was that whole experience like being? Wow, well, yeah, Iceland's, a, Iceland's an amazing place, you know. We were in Iceland for uh, nearly a year. Iceland's amazing. It's been so sheltered and so isolated for, for so many years that they've really created such a distinct and unique culture that is just a result of the climate and the people are very very friendly and made some wonderful friendships and of course the land is beautiful but for us it's really more about the people that we meet that's always more or less our focus than so much the surroundings you know it was fantastic we had a great time just getting to know the culture and the people a lot of people get to go to Iceland but only for weeks or something so you don't get the real grasp but we got to go there for so long, fortunately, that you get to see this evolution and how the climate has shaped the people that live there. And that was, I think, for me, the most interesting part because huh. we see this huge change from, from winter to summer with the people. It goes from like this barren landscape of just snow and these crazy storms and freezing cold and no growth or life of anything. And the people are sort of all kind of hunkered down and. And then all of a sudden in summer, it's like you see like 
the the flowers start coming out in the grass and just like the grass is so frantic to come to life the icelanders are the same way <laughs> so in summer all of a sudden the same people we knew in winter that were very relaxed and calm and slow in summer they're like okay we gotta go we're gonna go have a bonfire and then we're going to our friend's house but they're just like the bugs you know just buzzing wow. for life because they knew that that summer is such a short time so it's it's interesting how that shaped their 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 lives as well but of course you know oh, it sounds like it sounds like a wonderful experience it sounds like it might have been hard to leave it was hard to leave it, this is this is our first place we've ever been to where we have we have not wanted to leave, you know, really that, like, I mean, we wanted to leave because we we're always sort of anxious to go see other places, but at the same time, we, we absolutely loved it, you know, it was, a, it, was a, it was a fantastic place. I think you'll sail back there. Oh, definitely, Sounds for sure, that one day. Yeah, most most definitely one day. Wow. No, no, no doubt about it, so. And when did you leave Iceland and where did you go we, since then? Let's see, we arrived yesterday in the Faroe, so we only left Iceland like last week. Yeah. How was the passage to Faroe? Oh, it was a good passage. We had a really good weather window and it was a bit windy when we left in downwind conditions and, and so we hoped to for a little bit and and waited. He's okay. He can't flip. But anyways, it was a... Um, it was a uh, it was a good passage, a little windy in the beginning, but then sort of calmed down and we knew it was going to be calming down and, and so it was a downwind and we didn't have to jibe or tack the entire way. Uh, and then once we got here, it was really interesting just waiting for the tides and, you know, because we had to wait in two different sections, which is, I guess, part of the deal when you don't have an engine, but we arrived and so to go around the corner we had to wait like three or four hours then we went around the corner and then we were coming up here and then the tide was against us here so we had to wait like another four hours for it to switch so that we could end up uh, coming into here so but yeah but yeah now yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. yeah, yeah. and what are your plans from here explore this island and then we'll go to Torshevin the capital explore it for a bit and we kind of let if we meet some people and they tell us to go somewhere or something and we, we will often take them up on that and um, then after that we will be on to the Shetlands and, and then Norway and kind of go down that way. Where do you think you'll spend this winter? Our plan is to winter in Brittany, France in, the, in South Brittany where it's just of course they're just crazy about sailing and boats and that's their entire life. So. Sounds like a great place yeah. to be. Yeah, exactly. Perfect for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. yeah. How did you discover sailing? When did it all begin? Well, uh, I was. Uh, I I don't come from a sailing family or or, or any of that. Uh, so, I, but I happened to go to a high school that was near the ocean. So I was always kind of a surf bum and you know beach bum kind of person. And uh, but I met some friends that were on the sailing team. And so they would go out sailing on the weekends. And, and so one day I was able to go with them. And that's when I first sort of got the love for sailing. At that point, I knew it was just like, I knew it was for me, you know. <laughs> so after that point, I just tried to sail as, as much as I could. And mainly sailing on dinghies and, and racing dinghies. And then just saving all the money that I could so that one day I could, I could buy a boat, you know. Yeah. So. Is this your first boat or? You this is my boat? third big boat. But, well, you know, not a dinghy. It's my third boat. Uh, I, I first had a um, an old wooden boat, which was a lot of fun inside the harbor. I was in San Francisco, and um, so with that boat, I was I was sailing around and, and doing racing, and I was just looking looking around for something that I could sail offshore with. And one day, I came across this boat that was a. Uh, something that was in my price range, you know, so it'll uh, kind of all, you know, abandoned sort of in a way, uh, not not abandoned though, but um, I ended up meeting the broker and the, the broker tells me one day that the owner is, uh, the wife's in charge of the sale now and so she wants the thing gone, so any money that you have to offer, so I offered him 10,000 bucks and, and she took it. And so then I had this boat and then I, so I got rid of my, my boat that I had previously and I just started working on that and a month later then I, I started sailing south and that was a Formosa 38 oh, yeah. yeah these tanks and Tank. uh, just rotting everywhere and it was, <laughs> but it was a, it was a, it got me many 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 miles so I can't complain you know 
when did you decide to go cruising and, and living aboard? It was always sort of a goal of mine, but I never was able to either quite understand how to do it or I basically didn't, I, I couldn't afford it yet or wasn't able to find a boat that sort of what was going to meet my needs. And, and um, when I found this boat, I knew I could sail offshore. It was a safe boat and especially it was forgiving boats. You know, I could make many mistakes and nothing was going to happen, you know. Um, and at that point, then the, the, that's when the goal that I had to live on a boat and sail around, that's when it became uh, a reality. My plans were first to sail from San Francisco to Cabo San Lucas, Mexico. Mm. Basically just work there and then I met a uh, person from Costa Rica who basically said, yeah, we, uh, we have tons of work down there. Come, you know, come down there and work. And so I said, okay, and I kept sailing south and then I met my wife and, you know, so. And then next thing you know, you're in Iceland with four <laughs> kids. <laughs> <laughs> <So>. <laughs> oh my God. Uh. <laughs>